Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to um, speak archaeologically. I think this is a, a wonderful initiative and it's, uh, it's marvellous to, to contribute something um, to this, uh, this, this programme. So let me share my screen and I would say I'm going to talk to you today um, about visual representation, how uh, the ancient people of Mesopotamia represented their world. And I'm going to cover quite a long period, the so-called Early Bronze Age, between roughly 3500 and 2000 BC. And over the next hour or so, I will um, attempt to show you some of the highlights and some of the meaning behind this imagery. So let's begin. And I, I want to begin actually not in the Early Bronze Age, but a little earlier than that in what uh, scholars call the late Chalcolithic period. So really around 4,000 to 3,500 BC. Because what I want to show you is uh, Mesopotamia, the land between the, the Tigris and Euphrates, which represented today politically by the countries of Iraq and Eastern Syria, the origins of much of what we see in the early Bronze Age in terms of its visual imagery, the sculpture, the imagery, the drawings, um, have their origins a little earlier. And one of the best places we can see the origins of that imagery is at the site of Tel Brak, here in North Syria. It's a site that has been excavated for at least 70 years, but it's really the last 30 years of excavation at the site that has transformed our understanding of the region and of this particular period. Here's a view of uh, Tel Brak as it is pretty much today. Excavations there stopped in 2010 when the civil war in Syria broke out. Uh, but excavations had been continuing there for, for many decades. And what you're looking at is the so-called Tel of Tel Brak, the, the mound which is representing thousands of years of continual rebuilding using mud brick architecture. If one looks at the site of Tel Brak, as it were from the air in this digital map of the site, um, we can see how in the period 4200 to 3800 BC, the site grew dramatically. So if you look on the left of the slide, you'll see a, an aerial view of Tel Brak with the great central Tel in the middle. And then the yellow and red colors on the screen represent density of settlement. So in other words, small villages lying around the central mound, the settlement area. But by 3800 BC, that density of settlement had grown together to create one of the largest urban centers in the Middle East. So by 3800 BC, Tel Brak is one of the largest sites in the region. And people are coming together in large numbers. And this resulted at Tel Brak in challenges to the way in which the people were managed, but also the ways in which they represented their world. Now, if we look at Tel Brak around 4000 BC, we see that it's uh, areas of industrial activity with the production of textiles, uh, flint tools, as well as more exotic objects made from stones imported from long distance, such as obsidian from Turkey. And along with all that industrial activity, we start to see ways in which people were being managed. And it's through management that we see some of the earliest visual imagery. And what do I mean by that? Well, we see the impressions left in clay by small pieces of stone carved with designs which act as a seals. Clay applied to the knots that close baskets, bags and boxes were then impressed by stone seals carved with designs to leave the impression. And what we're left behind in the archaeology is of course the, the seals impressions themselves in the clay. 
And you can see from the few examples on the slide, a range of imagery um, impressed in these, in these clay ceilings. And they represent forms of identity, either group identity, perhaps some of the local villages bringing in produce to the center of the town, or individual identity, and perhaps marking status, power, authority. And a good example of that power and authority is the image you can see, I hope, on the right of the slide, which shows an impression from a round seal um, showing carved with a design of a rearing lion being attacked by a man with a spear. Now, this imagery in later Mesopotamian history would symbolize kingship. So perhaps already here, around 3800 BC, we have an individual who is marking his authority through this imagery, which would then become the standard form of representing authority in Mesopotamia. So the origins are clearly here in the fifth millennia BC into the fourth millennia BC, the origins of hierarchies of power and the symbolism and visual imagery that accompanies it. Alongside the seal impressions, you get clay also being used at Telbrat for record keeping, very simple notation, a little piece of clay, perhaps a centimetre high, impressed with a circular design, and then a scratched in the surface of the clay, a little animal, perhaps a donkey or a gazelle. And it's simply a record, perhaps the circle representing a number, so a certain number of these animals as a memory aid in clay. Again, hold that in your memory because these simple recording devices will be the basis for uh, representation much later in our story. But at Tel Brak, we also have representations in more uh, physical form in stone, designed to last. Small clay plaques, a few centimeters high, in these so-called eye idols. And these appear to represent humans in a very abstract form with the focus on the body and then on the eyes. And these little plaques were deposited in their hundreds, if not their thousands, at one site at Telbrak which was almost certainly a temple. So you, what you've got is a city with a focus for religious devotion and little gifts being given to the gods, perhaps in the form of the person who donated it. So these may represent the individuals who are giving them to their gods. And over time, hundreds are deposited in the temple and there they were discovered by the archeologists dating to around 3700 BC. So there you have some of the origins of the sort of story that we'll be exploring um, in Mesopotamia in the early Bronze Age. So from around 3500 BC onwards. And the best place for investigating that early story um, of Mesopotamian uh, civilization and its visual imagery is at the site of Uruk, way to the south of Telbrak, at the head of the Persian Gulf. This was a site that was excavated by uh, German archaeologists beginning in the early 20th century and revealed some really remarkable architecture and objects from this early period. The site itself today lies abandoned in the desert. The river Euphrates once flowed through the center of the site, but shifted in its bed over time, leaving the Uruk high and dry, abandoned for archeologists to excavate. And what you're looking at here are the remains of the great center of the city in which a huge mud brick tower or ziggurat was constructed. Now that building dates to quite late in our story. But at the foot of the ziggurat, archaeologists uncovered prehistoric monumental buildings dating to around 3400 BC. 
it was a world, a rich world, uh, full of uh, resources that could sustain thousands of people at Uruk. Uh, surrounded by date plantations, it was an extremely fertile world. The rivers having brought down uh, silt to form a great alluvial floodplain that was very rich for agriculture. And alongside the date palms, there were uh, reed marshes uh, full of animals, fish in the rivers. And as I said, uh, Uruk by this period um, was probably a city of some 10,000 people, if not more. And at the centre of the city, where the archaeologists were digging, they uncovered monumental buildings, which seemed to be a part of the uh, way in which the city was being managed. If you have tens of thousands of people in a settlement, uh, you need ways of organising them. And at the centre of the city, vast open courtyards surrounded by monumental structures here in these reconstructions, uh, suggest ways in which uh, the people with authority brought people together and managed the resources around them. Now these rather, uh, in some sense, fanciful reconstructions of what Uruk might have looked like are backed up by the archaeological evidence. And one of the most impressive ways in which Uruk was uh, decorated um, was through uh, monumental structures on a grand scale. Mon monuments that you would have been able to see from a distance. Here's a plan of those great buildings at Uruk. Um, using a plan like this, it's very difficult to get a sense of scale. So let's look, for example, at building D, one of these great structures next to the later Ziggurat Tower. A very ordered building a central hallway with uh, parallel rooms, uh, rows of rooms either side of that central hall, lots of doorways, so perhaps light and air would have been important within it. But it's the scale that's really impressive in these buildings because Temple or Building D was about the same size as the Parthenon in Athens. Uh, if it's a building you're familiar with, of course, built some 3,000 years after the buildings at Uruk and of stone, whereas the buildings at Uruk are of mud brick, but built on a similar monumental scale. And that was just one of these many buildings at Uruk. So very impressive, but involved hundreds, if not thousands of people being managed to build them. And along with the actual buildings themselves, the walls of these structures were decorated with mosaics. Cones, little uh, cones made from clay, simply rolled in the hand, so the size of a pen or a pencil, um, sharp at one end, blunt at the other, were pushed into these monumental walls. Uh, the blunt ends having been painted different colours. And the end result is mosaic patterns stretching over meters of these great buildings. So again, think about the number of people that would have had to be managed simply to decorate these buildings. Tens and th of thousands of clay cones manufactured in clay, baked in ovens to make them hard, dipped into paint and then pushed into the wall to form these mosaics. So suddenly one can imagine these uh, cities as very colourful, visual places, uh, no doubt accompanied by reed mat hangings and perhaps even woven textiles, along with these, uh, these more solid forms of decoration. And inside these buildings, the archaeologists discovered attempts to represent the, the natural world around them. And the most common imagery is of the domesticated animals on which the economy of Uruk relied. Sheep and cattle, domesticated animals that were, of course, uh, uh, cultivated for their meat, but more likely for the wool, 
and leather from the animals from which textiles could be manufactured. And so we see in stone and clay wonderfully modeled images of these animals that were so important in the lives of these cities. And these cities, of course, were actually very rural worlds. They were very close to the natural world, to the fields around them in which these animals grazed alongside the date palms and fields of uh, barley and wheat. Other animals uh, include, as I say, cattle. And here we have some more examples from Uruk showing again the extraordinary naturalism of these carvings. And these little animals carved in stone, and then some of them, as you can see, inlaid with other materials, either precious stones like lapis lazuli or metals. Uh, the image in the top center, its legs are made from silver. There are no metal resources, no metal is found in Mesopotamia, so this had to be imported, showing the wealth and power and sophistication of sites like Uruk. These little animals were then deposited in temples, in those monumental buildings, as offerings perhaps to the gods, or as substitutes, as sacrifices for actual animals. So extraordinarily complex relationships being built in these early cities um, with temples and the gods at their centre. Other imagery combines the domesticated animals of the farms, the cattle and the sheep with the dangerous forces that threatened them from the outside. Beyond the city walls, the wilderness of wild animals included lions. And lions, as we've already seen at Tel Brak, represented the most dangerous threat to these urban city centers. And here you can see some images in, carved in stone of lions attacking bulls and cows, uh, a, a recurring theme in the imagery of Mesopotamia from this time onwards, and represents that close relationship between the ordered, domesticated, civilized world of city life and the dangerous world beyond the city walls, where uh, the dangerous forces of nature were always there as a threat. In places like Uruk, they continue to use stamp seals, such as we saw at Tel Brak, and we have some actual stone examples surviving. The images on the uh, right of the slide show tiny little stamp seals carved in the shape of cattle or in the bottom of a seated woman. And the designs on the flat surface at the back then used to impress in clay. And the little uh, cow in the top of the image has um, rather strangely um, what appeared to be a pair of feet carved as a design on its back. Whereas the, the little woman has um, uh, designs which are very difficult to interpret, very simple abstract designs. And these were used to impress in clay. Clay such as the round ball of clay you can see on the left, which was used to enclose smaller balls of clay, or in some cases stone, which represented forms of counting. These are little tokens which represent commodities and quantities brought together into a ball of clay and then sealed as a way of remembering an act, a transaction. In the same period from around 3500 BC, we see the development of a new form of seal, the cylinder seal, a cylinder of stone which um, created a surface area much larger than a simple stamp seal and meant that the designs carved on it could be much more complex. So the image on the left shows a, a, a very elaborate cylinder seal with a tiny little silver ram dowelled into the top, whereas the design carved on the cylinder itself 
shows overlapping cattle above a row of reed huts. And these were cylinders used by senior administrators, probably responsible for the imagery um, carved on the surface of the seal. So in this case, the senior administrator would have been responsible for cattle and perhaps the produce of the cattle, maybe milk. And they would have used the seal to close storeroom doors or perhaps containers such as uh, vessels containing the milk. Other seals you can see on the right of the slide show other imagery. And in this case, we see a, a man feeding some of the flocks, goats and sheep. Those cylinder seals and their simple designs uh, probably are the source for one of the most impressive objects that has survived from ancient Uruk of this period the so-called Uruk vase. It's now in the Iraq Museum in Baghdad, and you can see it here in this photograph with this cut out of a man to give you a sense of its scale. It's over a metre high, carved from a single piece of limestone. And decorating the vase in relief are rows, registers of different imagery. And it's very much as if a cylinder seal lots of cylinder seals with different designs have been rolled around this stone vessel. Now, of course, that didn't actually happen because cylinder seals were used to impress on clay. But here, that same idea of the register system has been transformed onto a stone object. And what do we see on the Uruk vase? Well, that same interest in the natural world and the relationship of that natural world to the temples and the gods. Let's look at it in a little closer detail. Starting at the bottom of the vase, we can see a wavy line, which represents, of course, water. And emerging out of that water are vegetation. In this case, we have almost certainly uh, a flax plant, a, a plant for, for, for making uh, linen, uh, textiles, and probably a date palm two of the great important resources of Uruk uh, on which the economy relied. And then above these plants, we see a row of animals, uh, sheep, both male and female sheep, walking in procession around the vase, almost sort of endlessly walking around, which represents endless abundance in this imagery. Further up the vase, we see moving in the opposite direction to the sheep, a row of naked men, a procession of men carrying vessels overflowing with produce. The men are naked because um, they are almost certainly priests. And this is a typical way of representing priests in early Mesopotamia. Pure, um, they're shown pure, uh, absent of clothes to show their purity and a, um, a relationship with the, with the gods. And then in the very top of the Uruk vase, we see the largest register, the widest register, one of these priests presenting an enormous vessel full of produce, presenting it to a woman. She may be um, a, a high priestess, or perhaps the goddess herself, because we know from later evidence that the main goddess of the city of Uruk is the goddess Inanna. And she is a goddess of uh, fertility and uh, uh, procreation, uh, but also of aggression and power. And her symbol is uh, the thing you can see standing behind um, the the woman, in fact, there are a pair of them, this large pole with a circle at the top and some sort of streamer at the back. This is the symbol of the goddess Inanna. If we move around that top register, we can see behind those standards, the interior of what is probably the temple, full of produce that have been given to the gods, 
as well as some little statuettes and other carved imagery. This is probably what the interior of a Mesopotamian temple looked like. And we're seeing it here carved, represented in this uh, Uruk vase. So the procession of uh, the goods of the natural world brought the goddess in her temple, and she will then bless the world and continue to provide that abundance. We find images of uh, other forms of authority, as well as the gods, carved in sculpture from Uruk, this piece dating to around 3100 BC, the so-called Uruk priest king. And it is he who seems to be an important individual in the city. Um, he undertakes rituals, he undertakes uh, battles, he undertakes uh, the presentation of goods to the gods. So perhaps he represents, if not a king, at least a leading figure in society. We find him also involved in hunting. And remember again that little seal from Telbrach some 700 years earlier, but now carved on a great boulder um, at Uruk, um, a priest king shown twice, or perhaps two priest kings, spearing and hunting lions with a bow and an arrow. That relationship between the king and the lion, all very, already very, very clear in Mesopotamian imagery. The priest king is also shown on cylinder seals, and here he's shown in this particular case having been rolled across a square piece of clay. Um, you can see the designs, I hope, impressed in the clay, covering the entire surface of this little tablet. A drawing at the bottom of the slides shows you the complete rollout of the cylinder seal. So this piece of clay was sealed with a cylinder seal, and then, after having been sealed, it was written on. And this little tablet represents some of the earliest writing in the world. Um, little circles representing numerals, reminding us again of that little tag from Telbra centuries earlier. But now, along with the impressions of numerals, you get little drawings scratched in the surface of the clay, which represents the things being counted. And this is a simple recording device which allowed um, the complex recording of information, um, the movement of goods from the fields to the storerooms, and then distributed to the workers in this great city of Uruk. And in these particular examples of this early, these early written tablets, um, there are recurring signs uh, marked here in the red, tri uh, red rectangle. You can see what is in fact the profile of a human head on the left, and then a profile of a little bowl beside its mouth. And that combination of head and bowl represents a ration a distribution of goods given to workers in payment for what they've done. So whether they're building the great structures at Uruk or they're being paid for work um, in farming the land, um, this is accounting their rations, recording their distribution. Once the record has been made and the bureaucrats, the administrators have read it and recorded it, the tablets were simply thrown away, where archaeologists then found them in rubbish dumps. That little bowl beside the human head was almost certainly um, vessels like this, recovered in their thousands at sites of this period in Mesopotamia, the so-called bevel-rimmed bowl, which was almost certainly used for baking bread, as well as a, an all-purpose container for other things. And bread would have been the main ration probably handed to the workers in these bowls. So the visual imagery of writing pictographs representing the actual world of uh, ancient Uruk uh, 
central to the lives of individuals. Now, by the end of the fourth millennium, the beginning of the third millennium, so around 3000 to 2800 BC, we start to see the combination of text and imagery, carved imagery, on stone objects. And here's a, a couple of examples, the so-called Blau monuments now in the British Museum. They show images of the priest king and other individuals alongside scratched uh, writing, the same sort of writing that was on the clay tablets, which records um, the distribution of different goods. Now, this may be a record that was intended to last forever. Rather than on clay, it's being carved on stone. And this is almost certainly a legal contract designed to last forever, perhaps dedicated in the temples, so to be protected by the gods. So text, writing, and imagery closely connected in Mesopotamia. That visual imagery, again, having derived from things like cylinder seals. And here's the impression of a cylinder seal showing a priest king holding up a little vessel, just like he is on the Blau monument. Now, this is a tradition that will now continue through our next period, the next thousand years, in which images of individuals are associated with texts. This is the so-called stela of Usham Gal, now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And you can, again, I hope, see written all over the monument, this little scratched writing, increasingly becoming more wedge-like or cuneiform, as, um, as this writing is termed, wedge-like writing. This wedge-like writing can now start to be read and it records the Sumerian language. That writing records here the sale of a property and some goods. So again, it's very much a legal document. And what we see associated with the writing are images of individuals, a man on the left-hand side and a woman in the center, and then some smaller figures on the uh, right of the slide. And the text tell us that this is a sale document, the transfer of goods from the priest Usham Gal, uh, who we know is the man on the left because he has his name written on his skirt to identify him. And he seems to be transferring these goods to the woman who is uh, represented in the middle. And they are shown uh, uh, as undertaking a ritual um, at the door of a temple. Again, the relationship between people and the temple and legal contracts, very clear and close. Another example here, the figure of plume in the Louvre Museum shows again an individual undertaking a ritual at the, at the front of a temple building represented by two large uh, columns with uh, what looks like light, light bulbs at the top, but almost certainly can't be, um, and then covered in writing, which again records probably the transfer of land or goods between individuals. Stone then used to represent the eternal relationship between humans and the gods. And that becomes very clear with figures like this, Sumerian votive figures. Wealthy individuals, those who could afford to have them made, would have images carved of themselves in the round, and these would then be carried into the temple, where they would be dedicated to the gods on behalf of the individual. Presumably, the idea was that somehow, the statue remained connected in some way to the person who had commissioned them, and that the statue would then pray forever before the image of the god in the temple. And you can see that in early Sumerian society, men and women were represented 
the women um, wear different styles of, of dress uh, and have very different elaborate hairstyle. The men can be uh, shown with beards or shaven, and some of them have very long uh, side locks of hair. And as I say, these would have then been donated to the gods on behalf of the individual. Temples in Mesopotamia in this period were relatively small buildings, and therefore individuals would not have had access to the Holy of Holies, the place where the God was thought to live. So it would have been the priests who carried these into the temple itself. They continued to use cylinder seals, um, just as had been the case um, much earlier, but now the imagery on the seals changes from um, scenes of agricultural production and storage to more mythical, magical scenes. So some of them show uh, hero figures in combat with mythological animals or with lions and bulls. There are scenes of banquets, such as you can see in the bottom uh, left-hand side of the slide, uh, figures seated being served by individuals, again, in register system, just like we've become familiar with on other imagery. Or perhaps my favorite little uh, cylinder seal is the one in the top right of the slide, which shows two individuals, a man and a woman, seated either side of a very large pot, which contains beer, and they're drinking that through straws. Almost certainly a religious undertaking. And that religious undertaking is also shown on plaques such as this, which were designed to be, again, deposited in a temple. In this case, fixed to the temple wall with a nail which was driven through the hole in the center. Notice again that we're dealing with register systems, just like in the earlier Uruk vase. Again, thinking about those cylinder seal impressions and the authority represented by those seals. And in this particular uh, plaque, which comes from a site called Kafaje in Eastern Mes Mesopotamia, um, we see um, in the lower register, musicians. In the middle register, a procession of people probably bringing sacrifices and other produce to the temple. And in the very top, a banquet, just like on that cylinder seal, two individuals seated, a male and a female, being served uh, by uh, other individuals, being, uh, perhaps being served wine in this particular case, um, and probably again in a temple setting. So Mesopotamia, the Sumerian civilization, um, had emerged on the alluvial plains of southern Mesopotamia, uh, south of the region where the rivers come closest together, the rivers fan out across um, southern Mesopotamia before flowing into the Persian Gulf. And numerous city-states emerged in this region, which shared this same common culture. One site which grew to be particularly important politically was the site of Kish in the northern half of the alluvial plain. And at Kish, we have evidence for that political power in the form of a major palace building. Constructed from mud brick, it was decorated with inlays of slate and limestone, which showed processions of prisoners and soldiers towards a seated king. So here, around 2600 BC, we have some of the earliest imagery from Mesopotamia, which shows a king, a ruler of a city who is conquering other territory by leading his forces into battle. So although the earlier imagery was very much about the temple and its relationship with people, now we start to see that imagery of kingship come to the fore. And kings start to take over some of that earlier imagery for their own use. Kish dominates much of Mesopotamia 
perhaps for several centuries, but then other cities rise to power. And one of those cities um, was a, uh, a kingdom, um, the city-state of Lagash. Lagash and its important city of Giersu. Now, Lagash and Giersu has produced some of the most extraordinary imagery, which represents this rise of kingship. We see here from ancient Giersu, modern Tello, this plaque, it's a uh, stone plaque intended for a temple. Again, you can see the hole in the center, which allowed a nail to fix it to the wall. Covered in cuneiform writing, it tells us that this was dedicated in the temple by a king called Urnanche. And Urnanche is shown on the plaque twice. He's shown on the left uh, as the largest figure, and therefore the most important, carrying a basket of soil on his head. He's undertaking a ritual of making the first brick from which the temple will be built. And then in the lower register, we see Urnanche again, but this time seated, holding a, a cup in celebration of the temple having been completed. So kings now take on the responsibility of building for the gods and the visual imagery reflects that. We also see kings as warriors. King at Kish was certainly a warrior, but here at from Giersu, um, the king of Lagash, Eonatum, around 2500 BC, is shown on an enormous stone stealer, sadly only surviving in fragments. This is now in the Louvre Museum in Paris. We look at the detail of this stealer, we can see on one side, in this case on the left hand side, an enormous figure of a god who is shown standing and smashing the head of an enemy who's been caught in a great net. This is what the gods are going to do um, in heaven on behalf of their representative on earth, the king, who is shown on the right hand side of this slide on one side of the stela in a series of registers. And Aeonatum, the king, is shown leading his forces into battle on foot and in a chariot, and then celebrating success in a temple. Here's a detail of Aeonatum in his chariot, and he's defined as a king by his outfit. He wears a fleece robe over his shoulder and over his body made from the sheep's fleece, of course, sheep, um, such an important part of the life of Mesopotamia. And he wears a very distinctive helmet. His crown, if you like, is made from a helmet which has a band around it that holds his hair in place at the back in a bun, tied up at the back in a great knot. That headdress we know from other evidence. And we have an extraordinary example of one made from gold. Um, this again shows that headdress, the band around his head and his hair tied up at the back in a knot. Uh, so this is a headdress of kingship. And this was almost certainly, this gold example, almost certainly belonged to a king. It comes not from Giersu, but from another very important site of powerful city-state in southern Mesopotamia, the site of Ur at the head of the Persian Gulf. And there at Ur, archaeologists uncovered the burial place of what are almost certainly some of these kings and queens that were ruling over these cities. Here's a reconstruction of one of these burial places, a, a great grave cut into uh, the soil, um, a, shaft leading down into what is essentially a big pit and in one end of the pit a stone tomb constructed which contained the burial of the king or queen but on the floor of the pit most remarkably were the remains of human beings and animals and these are almost certainly sacrificial victims and um, killed to accompany their ruler presumably into a next world. 
along with these humans and animals and in the tomb itself were remarkable jewelry that covered all these bodies uh, so again dating to around 2500 to 2400 bc we see gold and lapis lazuli and carnelian um, covering uh, the the remains of these individuals an extraordinary wealth of these cities and i remind you there is no metal and very little stone certainly none of stone like this in mesopotamia itself this all has to be imported so again re reflecting the wealth and power of these cities one of the most famous objects from the so-called royal graves is the so-called standard of ur and we show see inlaid in, into this strange box-like uh, uh, object uh, using blue lapis lazuli and then she, uh, shell carved in designs we can see processions just like we saw on the stone plaques and on cylinder seals but now this is about kingship and in the top register we see the king larger than everybody else seated in his fleece skirt um, with uh, uh, rows of individuals before him on the other side of the standard we see a different scene in this case the king as the warrior rather than uh, celebrating uh, the peace as on the other side and here he is in the center of the scene in the top register again larger than everyone else holding a spear while his chariots in the lower register defeat his enemies that wealth of material gold lapis lazuli silver carnelian was all being imported from iran to the east or up the persian gulf um, from uh, the uh, world further east um, flowing into mesopotamia and then being used to decorate exotic objects in the royal graves Great objects like this which represent um, the world as imagined by the mesopotamians out to the east a world where animals act as humans and you had strange mythical creatures living in the mountains all that was brought to a head brought to unity if you like by a a city located somewhere in the region as indicated by the arrow the city of Akkad or Agade and the rulers of Akkad um, unified all the Sumerian city-states into an empire so through conquest uh, all the cities like Ur, Lagash, Kish were brought together into what is probably the world's first political empire. And we see some of that imagery of these kings of Akkad. King Sargon, uh, his imagery looking very, very similar to the sorts of imagery we've already seen. Processions of individuals, including the king, as well as great battle nets carved on stone. But as we move through the Akkad period, this period of empire, we see the imagery change to much more naturalistic and really quite extraordinary imagery. So here from the son of Sargon, Manish Tushu, a little later, um, a wonderful image of the king where you can see his robe actually moves, um, uh, carved very beautifully and um, to show the movement of the textile as the figure moves and that naturalistic take on uh, the imagery really reflected in objects like this this is a, a, a cast bronze head probably of manish tushu but um, it's difficult to know which akkadian king is represented but an almost life-size image of um, this absolute monarch similarly on cylinder seals of this period whole range of new imagery but particularly that of the gods being brought together in a collection of gods a pantheon of different gods brought together and beautifully carved but 
perhaps the greatest masterpiece of this period, of this Akkad empire, is the stealer of Naram Sin. Um, he is almost certainly the most powerful of these Akkad kings. He campaigned all the way into Syria and Turkey and the Persian Gulf as far as Oman and what is now the United Arab Emirates. Um, and his power is reflected on this stealer where the old register system disappears and we see his soldiers marching up a mountain to defeat his enemies while the king is shown larger than everybody else at the top of the mountain wearing in this particular case a horned helmet and if you wear a helmet with horns it indicates you are a god so for the first time in mesopotamia a king claims to be divine claims to be a god such was his power and authority Images of the kings of Akkad have been found right across Mesopotamia, demonstrating the extent of their power. But as all empires do, um, the, the empire eventually began to collapse. And one of the last kings of the Akkad empire was a king called Shah Kalishai. He, this is the seal of one of his scribes. And it demonstrates the wide ranging connections of the Akkad Empire. This beautifully carved seal with these hero figures giving water to these humped back bison. And these animals were not native to Mesopotamia, had, but have been imported from the Indus Valley. And indeed, it is in this period that Mesopotamia has close connections down the Persian Gulf, through the Indian Ocean, to the Indus Valley, and the Indus Valley civilization of the region of modern day Pakistan and Northwest India. And there are clearly very close connections between these two worlds. And we know that because seals like this have been excavated in Mesopotamia of this date. The standard seals of the Indus Valley civilization with their distinctive writing system have been found in Mesopotamia. And cylinder seals from Mesopotamia have been found in some of these Indus sites. So there was very much movement of ideas, traditions, people and imagery at this time. With the collapse of the Akkad Empire, we see the imagery of Mesopotamia change back to some extent to the idea of the king as the pious religious ruler. As we see here in these statues of Gudea of Lagash from Girsu, um, where he's shown seated or standing for dedication before his gods in a temple. But it is the city of Ur at the end of the third millennium that comes back to prominence and it reestablishes control over much of Mesopotamia, um, building monuments on an enormous scale to reflect its power, such as the famous ziggurat at Ur, one of the first monuments of its kind constructed in Mesopotamia, so around 2100 BC. And the empire of Ur stretched out through Mesopotamia, out into the highlands of Iran. And to end the story um, at a point, uh, one has to end it somewhere. It's a story that, of course, continues. But I will end at this point with this imagery of these great rulers of the city of Ur, um, which dominated Mesopotamia down to around 2000 BC, a great stealer of ur -Nama, or perhaps his successor Shulgi, um, fragments surviving, showing the king making a dedication in a temple to his god, whereas a cylinder seal of this period, beautifully carved, but again, back to that religious scene of a horned figure, 
a female deity introducing the king to a seated figure under a crescent moon. So again, power, imagery, writing, all brought back together again in service of the gods. Thank you very much indeed.